I had my uh, first experience with Israel in 1958. Uh, I was a junior in high school, very secular, never bar mitzvahed. And my father asked me, uh, do you want to go to Israel for the summer? I think they just wanted to get rid of me. And my first thought was, gee, to go overseas, this would really impress the girls. So I went in 1958 for eight weeks on a B'nai B'rith tour where we toured the whole country. There wasn't much of a country then. Jerusalem was divided. There was no West Bank. Israel was still this very small country under a lot of duress by the Arabs. In those years, Israel went through three major wars. The big one, of course, was the War of 1967, the Six-Day War, where for security reasons, Israel took back the Golan Heights, Jerusalem, and the West Bank. 1961, when I was in Israel, I saw two sessions of the Adolf Eichmann trial in Jerusalem. As I was growing up through my high school and college years, two of my very dearest friends, Patty Bitker and Michael Rhodes, I used to sit and tell them about Israel and what it was like and how much I loved it. And here it is, 2010, and what's happened? My dear friend Michael Rhodes and my dear friend Patty Bitker have been living in Israel for decades. And now Mayor has the beard and, and, and he is so committed to Israel and to the Jewish movement. Um, Patty, on the other hand, became a journalist in Israel. She became the voice of Israel. If you were ever listening to the news in the United States, they would say, and here's Patty Golan from Israel. Patty moved way to the left. Uh, she did not believe in the settlements after the Six-Day War. She believed that Israel should give back the settlements for peace. Mayor is having his 70th birthday and he wants me to come and celebrate it with him in Israel. Mayor lives in a settlement called Bat Ayan. It's a settlement that was founded in 1987 by 10 men, including Ariel Sharon. It is 15 miles southwest of Jerusalem in the Jordanian Hills. Now there's 170 families that live there, mostly religious. It's surrounded on three sides by Arab villages. And it's going to be interesting. I'm going to see Mayor. I'm going to see Patty, two of my long lost friends who we all used to hang out at the beach together. And here it is, what is it, 50 years later. And um, I'm going to see what their life is like. I'm going to get a real feeling for Israel today, what's going on. Yeah, I think I got a right to be nervous. It's been my whole life thinking and talking about Israel. And now, thanks to Mayor, I've got to be there. This used to be the shooting gallery here. This peace process, uh, the Obama administration is refusing to concede that direct talks between the Israelis and the Palestinians are dead. But Israel's decision not to extend a freeze on settlement construction of the West Bank has left everyone right now on pins and needles. This place is uh, called Bat Ayan. It's in the Judean Hills. We're exactly between Karon to the south, about um, a half hour's drive. To Karon, inside to the tomb of the patriarchs, the Machpelah, to the south, and due north along the Derek Avot, exactly the same distance as Jerusalem, uh, the outskirts of Jerusalem with another, by walking another 40 minutes into the Temple Mount. Uh, I moved here because I'm a Jew, and this is my home. Why not Tel Aviv or Jerusalem? I like the country. Uh, that soul called to me, really. It's all about soul, you know, about where you're, you're supposed to be at in your place. This was my place. How long have you been living here? Well, full time, about seven years. But we remember we came members here um, in 1997, 13 years ago. This is my bar mitzvah here. I was a public school teacher in New York City, working third grade. I was a public school teacher for almost uh, 30 years. Public schools, yeshivas, private schools. I was a working teacher, and uh, I was very affected by um, what uh, what I saw was injustice 
to, uh, to other peoples and I wanted to give back. So I went to teach into the black nation. I was well accepted as, a, as an Orthodox Jew, as a from Jew. And I taught in the neighborhood that I lived in for 20, 29 years. I taught for 21 of those years. And uh, my neighbors, kids would come to the house for cookies. And, uh, I mean, just went out. I would walk home with my kids, put them in the buildings, and everybody on the block. Between Utica and Schenectady, one of the tough, I, I taught in the cocaine wards. Be, uh, between the uh, Jamaican gangs and the, uh, and, uh, 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 what was it, um, uh, the name will come to me. Anyway, the senior moment. So that's where I was teaching. Taught in Oakland. I taught for the Black Panthers. I mean, not for them, but they allowed me to teach. I worked all the way through the Oakland public school system. I was a, uh, uh, a very good propagandist. I knew African history uh, very well. I studied it early. I was very affected by what happened in the Civil Rights Movement. And, uh, I was involved in the Civil Rights Movement in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee radicalized me and then became connected to other organizations. I worked in the Civil Rights Movement for many, many years. Again, the question is, what since you've been here, since you've been in the Army, since you've worked with the people here, has it changed your idea at all about Israel and about these people here in the West Bank. I came out here to join the army because I believed that I believed in the importance of the state of Israel. Do you think they can compromise and get peace? I think eventually they have to. I mean, who, who wants to continue living like this? It is so tranquil here. Everybody is so up and positive. I mean, it's like Shangri-La here. And this is the tough West Bank. Yeah, it's like that though, until somebody gets killed here. Yeah. And uh, it's just a matter of time before, you know, somebody from the village over there <clears throat> who's not handling the situation as well as you are, who doesn't feel that it's so tranquil out here, uh, decides to come over here and sort of uh, release that anger that he's feeling. And then it's not so peaceful anymore.
You're going to drive, so you, you can fit put, two people. You could take the Michelin brothers. You'd probably rather yeah. take them. I'm going, I want to go early, though. So who are you going to go with? Whoever goes first. The, I think the Hasa should go for well, you, at three. Well, you know. Is it dangerous where we're going today? Huh? Is it the Mesukan? No way. No, forget it. It's very quiet. But usually, no. You know, also, the, they see the car. Yellow is like the Arabs, you know? Yeah, it's true. You think it's an Arab They taxi don't throw probably. stone in this. What are you doing in the West Bank? West Bank? Yeah. It's bad. I don't know what he's talking about. Arab want peace. But you know who the, the big people, the big, uh, the big, uh, uh, how do you call that? The big uh, men in the, in the Arabs. The millionaires and the Arabs, they don't want the peace. They want to make more money and more money. And the, the normal people are going to eat, you know, from the floor. And the, the Arabs don't understand that. If they understand that, one day they're going to wake up and go take their, you know, kill everybody. No mafia. When they have mafia, they have problems. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Yeah, I, I think that uh, there are two parts uh, of Hebron. There's the uh, Jewish quarter, uh, which uh, is a very small sliver, a very tiny part of Hebron, and then there's there, the Arab quarter of Hebron, which is huge. Uh, a lot of money has come into Hebron from the Saudis, but Jewish Hebron has never been allowed to develop. And if the, I think the Arabs and Jews could get along, if uh, if there was a, uh, if the if the Israeli government would allow uh, the the opening of, of of stores, Jewish stores, they allow the Jews a presence in Hebron. As a matter of fact, there was a meeting a year and a half ago. It was actually squashed. People didn't even know about it, or if they knew about it, the film was taken off YouTube. There's a meeting between um, Noam Arnon, who is the mayor of Hebron, Jewish mayor, and uh, the head of the Jabari clan, uh, who he represents this old Czech, that brings about 80,000 Arabs, his descendants. And he said the same thing I'm saying now, the era, that the Jews are not uh, settlers, they, they live in Hebron. They're, they're as much a part of Hebron as, as the Arabs. Where are you from originally? Houston, Texas. Texas? Yeah! Wow. You know it. This is like cowboy town, isn't it? It sure, oh, it sure is. Definitely is. This is cowboy town. Are there any place. interaction with the Arabs here? Yeah, we fight all the time. <laughs> Nothing peaceful? Uh, occasionally. Occasionally when they behave. We allow them to walk on our streets until they start throwing rocks, and we don't allow them. Do they allow you to walk on their streets? No. About five years ago, six years ago, a uh, Jewish father was standing right here, not 20 feet from here, holding... Standing, holding his daughter, he had an eight-month-year-old daughter, or a 10-month-year-old daughter, under a year in his hands. An Arab sniper from that hill, one of those houses, shot his girl in his hands. And she died right away, I mean, she, you know, and it was, uh, it was a very big thing at the time. So, so any day, if they feel like it, they can... Take a shot at us right here. Yeah. There's over 100,000 Arabs in Hebron and there's about 500 Jews. 
in three neighborhoods. So. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. But you're talking to the Arabs now, aren't you? They're always talking. There's all kinds of dialogue. First of all, the the the, the Harsina clan, and especially the Jabari clan. The Jabari clan, and they say, is a, a Jewish. How does that happen? The matriarch of the Jabari clan who was taken in the holy conquest. You know, you say 200 years ago. So, a woman, according to Jewish law, her descendants are Jews. So, you have a whole, and you have also intermarriage between Arabs and Jews in that part of uh, in that part of the world, south of Hebron. Everybody knows about. So, that. what are, what are they what are they so upset about the the oh. the Patty Patty Bitker? This is Patty and Golda's house. We're near Beersheba, and this is their backyard. Okay, this is in 1996 in Lebanon in Baalbek, uh, and I'm interviewing the head of Hezbollah, whose name is Subhi, and I can't remember his last name, but he was the head of Hezbollah in 1996. Okay, this is uh, in Kuwait during the elections of 19... I can't remember now. Must have been 1994, the Kuwait election. Here, this is um, the, uh, the this is the head of Palestinian police in Gaza. This is Frej, uh, this is Mayor Frej of Bethlehem. This is the president of Lebanon, um, um, Al Hariri, who uh, who has was assassinated, and his son is now the president of Lebanon. Hmm. Tell me why the settlers are full of shit. Pure self-interest. I come from a security point of view. I'm not religious, but I'm afraid if we give back the West Bank that it's going to hurt our security. Well, why, why is this not a concern of, 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 of normal people that have lived here? The settlers are not worried about security. They're not afraid of that. They see this as the biblical land of Israel which Redemption. God gave to the Jews, yeah. and therefore they are allowed to do whatever they want in order to have it. And you can't have it without... Consequences. Consequences, and you can't have it without... Oppress. Oppress. Thank you very much. There are two newspapers in English. One is the Jerusalem Post, there's an English edition of Haaretz, which um, is a, a far better paper journalistically than the Jerusalem Post, but it's, but it's much more to the left in the Israeli context. I mean, what, what's real and what's, uh, what, what's imagined are two different stories. That's the whole story of where we live and what's going on here. We've been created as monsters by the media. Well, they feel you're, you're the impediment to the peace process. Well, sure, if we would disappear. Today, for the new U.S. brokered Mideast peace talks, Israel resumed the construction of new settlements in the West Bank. The Obama administration had, hurt, had urged the Israelis not to end a 10-month moratorium during talks in Washington earlier this month. Those talks were the first between Israelis and Palestinians in nearly two years. But if, if, they, if we would disappear and everything rolls back, the Arabs don't want Jews in, the, in Palestine. They've said that straight out. As Gaddafi... Yamak Shimo said in an interview in Time magazine, which was very interesting, I think it's a must read. He said when when people when the when the leaders of the world get together, one of the topics on the table is how to get rid of the Jew. I don't get it. I don't get it. You got an area, you know, you got an area until the Jordan River, until Jordan, full of angry, oppressed people who want their own state. 
the only way that you can keep things quiet is by military occupation. How many years can this go on? You can't stop violence until you give them freedom. It's very simple. And their freedom means that you have to evacuate a lot of these settlements. Probably at this point, not all of them. Not where your friend lives. That will probably remain. But eventually something has to be done. You, it can't go on forever. Or you annex and you give everybody the right to vote and you finish with the Jewish state. That's because of their overpopulation. Of course, of course. All right, my question is, all the land that they want, they had. They had after, before 1967, and they still attacked Israel. We didn't have that land. We didn't want that land. Well, not exactly true. Well, we wanted it, but we were happy with what we had. They attacked us. It's not 67. 67 is 48, with a few modifications. Modification will last more than a dozen years. Nobody can live on uh, being surrounded by Arabs and harassed, and that's exactly what's going to happen. The Jews will be run out of Israel. You know, Israel will be unlivable. What's the answer? The answer is to, you know, the status quo at this point. The Arabs are doing well, as you'll see when you go into, uh, we'll pass through Arab villages, uh, many villas. Uh, the economy is very strong. I think the, the uh, Israeli Arabs are living better than any Arabs in the Middle East outside of, you know, the wealthy uh, uh, Ar Am emirates, uh, the cousins. But uh, as far as the average Arab is concerned, I think he's doing very well. And I, I, I question myself whether they want to, uh, the Arabs themselves want to be under the, 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 the Palestinian Authority, the Mafia. I mean, they ripped off the, uh, the, the, the people terribly. Uh, I don't think the Arabs want the, uh, the Palestinian Authority over them, and I certainly I don't think they want Hamas over them. I think there are many, many Arabs that uh, don't want don't want uh, a Palestinian state. I think young people do. I don't believe that the older people do. I have conversations with people. And um, they won't say out front, but they're, they're not so excited about a Palestinian state. Is it radical to say that God promised the land to the Jews? Is that radical? I always said, if people say God promised, then there's no way to work out anything. You know, humans have an idea that they have to find solutions. I think that's pride. There may not be a solution. Trying to fix everything is, is taking maybe a role that isn't ours. There's a problem, but I don't have to fix it. I have to do what I have to do. I have to get up in the morning, wash my hands, thank God that I'm alive, have a kosher home, keep the family. I don't have to solve the world's problems. That is an erroneous belief, and I think a lot of our energy is spent trying to solve problems that are with, not within our range. We just have to do what we have to do. I don't have to solve problems. And I think a lot of the media is based on getting people busy thinking and talking about problems that they're not going to solve to avoid actually issues that they should solve. I should be cleaning my house. I don't have to solve the world's problems. talk about it and to think they're going to fix it. But we talk about giving. All right, God gave us this land and there's room for the Arabs too if they were Ben Gurion offered the land to the Arabs. He said, join us. And that's when they started the war. It's, and written, it's written in the, in the Declaration of Independence. Whereas in Jordan, you know, a Jew isn't allowed to stay in Jordan. Did you know that? A Jew is not allowed to stay almost anywhere. In exactly. The Where's, why isn't the world so upset about the lack of that democracy? Where's your friend from South? Why isn't she up in arms about the fact that Jews aren't allowed to stay in Jordan? Why isn't that upsetting her? Why does she always want to hate herself? It's, it's, it's a kind of a sickness that Jews love to hate themselves. We can have uh, Barack Hussein Obama become president of the United States right. after the Americans are involved in, in Iraq. I mean, anything can happen. So right, but he, he is pro, he's pro Palestinian. I mean, he makes no bones about that. He's very strongly pro Palestinian. To condemn the building of 1,600 units in, uh, in, uh, in Ramat Shlomo, which is not a settlement, it's part of Jerusalem, it's not even negotiable. It's, everybody agrees that Ramat Shlomo is not negotiable. It's part of the uh, Jewish part of so Jerusalem. So for them to come up and condemn 
the Israelis for, uh, for building 1,600 units in North Jerusalem, not even East Jerusalem, shows that the Americans are provocative in looking for, a, uh, looking for an argument. But don't you think it could be just rhetoric to make the Arabs happy? Well, I think he hasn't actually done anything to hurt Israel. Well, we don't, we don't know. My name is Deborah Kanakab, and this is my husband, <laughs> And um, we live in Banayim for nearly 10 years. And we chose to come here because we wanted to be in a community where we felt like we could make a difference in building up the land. And um, Banayim is a very unusual place, very special, very spiritual place, very beautiful. I feel like it's up to us to improve ourselves so that we become um, greater individuals and thereby a greater nation and thereby um, the master of the world will uh, change the situation. Do you think there'll ever be peace here? Of course there will. Of course there will. That's the vision of um, the way we promised by our prophets. People don't understand the settlers and, and, and why they're here and, and what they're doing. And uh, are they infringing? Are they hurting the peace process, so to speak? I think we first have to clarify it's actually not settlers. It's if anything we could call ourselves inheritors. You know, the settlers it, uh, implies that we're coming to take away something from someone who perhaps deserves it more, which is not true. We uh, were inheritors. We, we deserve this land because God promised it to us, specifically. Okay, sir, you know what? When you have the car, you call me, okay? Thank you, bye. That's a rabbi? Nice guy, he's not stupid. Nice guy, trying to sell me. <laughs> it's really I think we got ripped off yesterday in the, in the Mishtala. You know, they. You speak English, they see you're an American, you're just a fat turkey. God love them. I mean, I love Israelis. I have, I have a good time here. I've been here many years. And I, I understand that. It's just part of the Middle East mentality. See, what's going to happen? Actually, what I like, but I know it's heresy, <coughs> I like one nation, two people. I like, because I, what's going to happen here is this. Uh, you see, it's, it's too complex. You see, to make a... So what do you do with the army? What do you do with the Knesset? Uh, how do you, how do you create a situation where, 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 where Arabs would become part of a Arab Palestinian state? Somebody said you could call it. Uh, they had an interesting name. You could make a fusion of Israel and Palestine, call it Real Pal, <laughs> or Izzy Stein. Now Izzy Stein would be a little bit too Jewish. I think the Arabs would go for Real Pal, the state of Real Pal. We're in a st we're stuck. Worst. Only God's going to get us out of this one. I think that uh, that since I've been in this uh, wheelchair, I've been able to work much more so on my relationship with God, and uh, that gives me a lot of hope because um, <clears throat> if a person concentrates <clears throat> more on the spiritual, then the physical becomes less important. And um, I think that's part of the reason I ended up in the wheelchair. I didn't have enough of a balance between the physical and the spiritual. And now working on my relationship with God, I feel like my spiritual uh, side has been strengthened. And therefore the physical, the, the ability to walk, the ability to run, to jump, to play sports, becomes less immediate, less important. Um, I do hope, with God's help, that I will be able to get out of the wheelchair and walk again because I feel that I have perhaps more time on some level than other people because um, there are a lot of things that I can't do. So therefore I have more time to concentrate on prayer or, or learning Torah and um, it certainly has taught me a lot, of, uh, a lot about balance. I don't know, but the Jews are tough, man. They're not going to give in. It's not going to happen. You're not going to have another uh, Gush Katif, oh, where the where the you know the Americans are saying the Israelis have to prove themselves. We what's, the, what's Gush Katif? Well, Gush Katif was the was Gaza. 
we had, uh, I don't know, eight, ten thousand 10,000 Jews living there and a very, uh, very prosperous agricultural settlements where they're producing almost a billion dollars worth of agricultural products. Was, the, the Israelis destroyed it. Now, I'm not sure about the numbers. You mean the it, Arabs destroyed it? The Israelis destroyed it. The Israeli government, Arab Sharon, he realized after he did it, it was, he had a stroke, copped a stroke after it. They made a, a, a blunder. Because what happened? They turned over the agricultural settlements to the Arabs, and what did they do with it? They destroyed everything. As the Israelis were deporting... Uh, Wait, who destroyed the stuff? The Arabs. You said the Israelis. The, the Israelis destroyed the homes. They, they, they evacuated the Jews. But the Arabs came in, they were given over the, uh, the, uh, the agricultural base, base of these uh, settlements, and they destroyed them. They ripped them apart, and they started rocketing as the Israelis were pulling out. But this is a known fact. What? That the Gaza Strip is an artificial creation because of the the war when the Egyptians were were um, proceeding forward to attack Israel. That's where the that's that's where they sort of got stuck when the war ended with victory, the Israeli victory, and the it was a decision made in the Arab world to keep them there because. They wanted to have something to point at. They wanted to have uh, um, uh, people to show that the world can pity that the Jews are keeping them in these slums. When in fact, they are not allowing them to, uh, to come out of there. They're stuck in Gaza. They're living in slums. The UN, the UN is keeping them there. And you know, Shterot, the, the town that's being perpetually uh, bombed with these missiles from Gaza, was a, um, a town that was set up for refugees, for Jewish refugees from the Arab world. And, um, but meanwhile, these people in Gaza are refugees stuck there, being kept there by the UN, by the Arab world, and not being allowed to, to live normal lives. So uh, that has to be clear, that it's not the Jewish people that are inflicting suffering on the Arabs. And it breaks my heart that there are Jews out there that buy into all this garbage and untruth. It really, it's, it's so sad. It's so sad that there's such a beautiful Jewish heritage. There's such, and there's such distortion and perversion that they're accepting as the truth. But if they would take the time, and this is something that verifies it's, it's worth their time to look into, to understand the facts, and to embrace their heritage with pride and with joy, and to help us to accomplish our goal in this world, which is really to bring peace. And you're saying to me shows why would Obama intentionally or Hillary Clinton intentionally antagonize Israel? What's in it for the them? The Arabs, the Arab, Arab money. You know, the Arabs hold huge, huge amounts of, uh, of American debt, guilt, oil. Yeah, but that, you know what? It's Saudi Arabia. It's these countries oh, that so hate the Bahrain, Palestinians Saudi too. The, Amer the Emirates, why? They hate the Palestinians too. They're yeah, afraid of but them. Yeah, but they hate the Jews more. What you don't understand is, yes, they do hate the Palestinians. Don't give a damn for them. But they hate the Jews. More. Well, I think if they came out publicly and said that 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 the Palestinians would go even crazier, the Hamas or the Hezbollah. Well, they know that. What does don't Obama you? want? He wants uh, to be reelected. He wants to. Be, he thinks he's. He thinks he's the Black Messiah. He has in, it indicates that the, the Jews went for him because of the color of his skin, and because, of course, he was a is a skillful skillful politician. He's a brilliant uh, he's a brilliant speaker, and they want to change. And I think, in one, one, many ways, it's very positive. I think that for the black community to have a black president has been wonderful. I see it was just in New York, and and uh, well, I, sat, I sat in the subways and watched you know kids, you know young kids who were reading. Reading a lot of a lot of black kids are reading today. They see that there's opportunities. So in many ways, it's positive for the Americans, but for us, he's not. I'll never leave here. Feet first. We're never out of here. And that's the way Jews feel. That's the way we, we came from Auschwitz to here. We came out. The, the people who founded by Ian, their children of their, their parents were all in Auschwitz. That's why there's no German products allowed. You can't drive a Volkswagen in Bad Ian. And live here. You can come in as a visitor. They don't. Uh, no German products. You can't display any. Uh, they, they, we're, as long as we're connected to the land, nothing can move us. Nothing. And, and I think the Jew realizes that the Israeli. We're not afraid of the Americans at this point. 
we're disturbed and they want to make it tough for us, okay. They'll make it tough for us, but we never leave. We never leave. And they say this isn't our country. And yet, and most of the world accepts the Bible and they know that God promised this land to the Jewish people. We pray to have leaders that will say proud and strong, this land was promised to the Jewish people. The world knows it's true and it's waiting to hear it. I think and many, many Christians in America know that fact and are waiting for Israel to be proud and loud and clear. The archaeology Everything points to the fact that this land was promised to the Jewish people. Why is there an argument about it? Everyone knows it belongs to us and yet they say we stole it. So it's, it's not our problem. Do they talk about the United States stealing Arizona, New Mexico and California? And what do the Australians do with the locals? What? what? Why is the world so obsessed with Israel? Because Israel is the center of the world. Israel is the center of the world. That's why they're obsessed. Non-Jews can kill each other and no one cares. No one cares, but if, if any Arab is hurt, the whole world gets upset. Okay, we won it in war, fair and square. Yeah, the, you know, the, the Goyim burned us. We came out of Europe. Rosh Hashem, we came home. Yeah, thank God, you know. What a lesson. We're here at, at the end of times, not giving up anything. You know, I don't care what you say or how something. I'm not saying anything. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the people who are out there, who you're going to show this to. People should know what we think. They don't even when know what we think. Israel they have no idea what we're even thinking about. And yeah, we're the biggest enemy in the world. We are who everybody hates. Why? We're settlers on the hilltops. We are we we are the hilltop youth, and everybody hates our guts. Why? Because the Jew says no. You know what the story of our people is right now? The story I heard a mushal that they took a um, in, in the times of gladiators when the last time we were destroyed. So they took um, and they took Jews into the into the arenas in in in, in Rome. There's a lot of Jewish gladiators, and one Jew who was particularly rebellious and fought against them. So they took him and they put him into this arena. And they buried him up to his shoulders in uh, in sand, up to his shoulders, without his arms. And they see and, and oh, sorry, there was one arm. They allowed him one arm, and. Uh, and they let, put a lion on him. One arm with the Jew buried up to here. And as the lion came to, the, to, the, to kill the Jew, the Jew bit the lion. And the lion jumped back. And the whole Colosseum screamed out, No fair, Jew! No fair! No fair, Jew! No fair! Okay? But we'll bring the whole thing down. We can do it. West Bank this Monday, it was very clear that the settlers have started building once again. We saw it in more than one settlement uh, across the whole of the West Bank. And this has caused disappointment to many people, not just the Palestinians who have called for this freeze to be extended. We've heard disappointment, as you say, from the U.S., also from the European Union, from the United Nations. Uh, all sides wanted Israel to extend this 10-month settlement freeze. Look, when Herzl started... Zionism. Originally, he wanted all the Jews to become Christians. Do you know that? No, I didn't ever know that. Mm -hmm. We have to solve the problem of anti-Semitism. So let's do it by <clears throat> by converting. But he saw that he wouldn't manage to get. He he saw that we have a problem of anti-Semitism, so we mustn't be Jewish. Yes, God gave us this land, but the only way we're going to keep it is with strength. It's not strength, because if we don't know what we're doing, if the soldiers are not convinced that this is a legitimate, then they don't have the strength. We, we have to have a, a powerful ideological base, based on faith. Absolutely the opposite of the press. You didn't see me, I could have taken you to Arabs, and you would met, I could do a borough, uh, not shown the whole Hebron connection. You know why like Hebron is so quiet all the time? They have a few kids throwing rocks, you know why? Because they're connected into the Hamulas. Who's the Hamulas? The Hamulas the are big the families. Many of them have Jews in them. This is not such a simple situation, and the, and and this and this this information has been suppressed. They don't they don't play it in the press, but you can get it on YouTube. Jewish Palestinians. There's there's lots and lots of Jews out there. They want Shalom. They're, and and they can do business. They don't want the PLO. They rip them off. 
you know, the, the Fatah are, were, were thieves. Hamas at least had integrity. Their they're, they're, they're insane hatred for Jews makes it impossible to deal with. I mean, but it's one God, it's one God and one land, and that's the way it's going to stay. One God, one land. You know, I mean, everything is negotiable, and not this. We will never move. It's, it's, it's got to be the settlers. It's got to be the West Bank. That's, that's the problem. Once that's solved, everything's going to be fine. Why, why did the 67 wall break? Exactly. Up? Why? I lived here in Netanya as a child where the Arabs wants to cut Israel in half. Why did 48 start? To the Arabs, it makes no difference if you're in Tel Aviv or Haifa or here. Every time the banks fall, it's the Jews' fault. You understand? Now they're blaming the Jews for the war, the, the war with the Afghanis. I mean, look at this government. It, it, you want to talk about stupidity? And nine one one, a nine out of the eleven uh, bombers, suicide bombers, were Saudi Arabian, right? Nine out of the eleven. What did the, the Americans do? They bombed Afghanistan. What did Afghanistan have to do? With, <laughs> why did they bomb Pakistan? Why did they bomb Jamaica? <laughs> <laughs> it was like the most absurd thing you could. Why are you banging up? You're getting back into Afghanistan. What fool would you direct them in that way? Only a college boy could take man. Only a college could take a, a, a mind and, and, and put it into that place. Then the Americans come up with a president. I mean, look at how, what's going on in the world. First of all, the markets crash right before the elections. A, a, a half term senator, articulate guy, and an interesting guy, very interesting with an interesting background. Uh, emerges as a as a presidential candidate in the Democratic Party takes Iowa and blitzes through the United States, white United States. Amazing. People are fainting at his at his at his speeches, fainting, and and he emerges with the name Barack Hussein Obama. <laughs> uh, what, what are you talking about? With questionable parentage, from a, a, a you know from a Muslim background, the Americans are fighting. Islam in Iraq, they're fighting in Afghanistan. What is going on? You will notice that not only is it new, but it is also almost completely uh, vacant. There's nobody on the road. That's because it's it was built to service communities that are not yet built. And these communities are going to be, some of them are going to be populated by communities that were evacuated from the, from from the Gaza Strip in 2005, and they demanded, um, and the government let them get their own own community so they could still stay together. These are people that were thrown out of the Gaza that Strip. That they were evacuated. That they were uh, evacuated from the Gaza Strip in the during the the uh, the uh, under under Arik Sharon. Uh, okay. In in 2005. Now, um, this area, which is called Lachish, L-A-C-H-I-S-H, -H, that's, a, that's a zone, it's not an actual place. I mean, there's a place called Lachish, but this is a zone. Okay. Is, is one of the most, if not the most, ecologically delicate places in the country. It's the, it's the transition zone between the Mediterranean and the, um, and the Negev Desert. And it's got all kinds of really special, unique flowers and, and sites and wildlife. These settlements uh, were approved despite the fact that, that there's a, a law passed after 15 years of contentious discussion. And, and it, it bypasses the law. I mean, it, it just... So where are these people living now? Uh, various places. I mean, uh, but they will be living here. Some are already living here. My, my, my Judaism is very connected to uh, the Shoah. I was born in 1940. My people were a first generation European Jews from Poland. Uh, I saw people come out from the Shoah. I was five years old. People coming out just twisted and broken. and so the, the silver teeth, I call them. They all had these le lead teeth. They were lead, le the lead teeth man. They came out, you know, uncle, cousin, label with just leaded teeth gone, yellow, you know coming out from uh, the furnaces. So that burned into me. And then I realized very early on that, uh, that so much of my, uh, my emotion and connection is to that time. Yeah, maybe even my, uh, my reincarnation, I believe, when we, we Jews believe in. When I went to the wall, to me, all of that was present there. 
the pain of the Jewish people. You know, it's like growing up Jewish, even in America, you know, you you know, you, you get your history. You don't grow up Jewish in America without knowing your history. Well, today it's possible because there's so much assimilation, but, but at the wall, you could feel the pain of all that, but the constant f focus on it, you know, it has to be, uh, it, it has to be transformed in some way. We have to take the pain and bring to it the desires that that pain generates, the desires for freedom, the desires for being Jewish in a world that accepts it. And it, you, know, you have a place here that's designed for Jews to live. You know, it was given to you, it was given to us, and we could live here, you know, people could live here. So, you know, in Poland, they used to make weddings for the last century. We live in a semi, we're in between centuries. But our ancestors, my grandfather, grandfather, in Poland, they used to make big weddings. Every plant that's now blooming, that's a much closer, that's really living religion. That's not, I'll be kind to this one, it's living faith. You know I mean, it's not about me. I'm only the messenger. Everything I am, I'm just a messenger. I don't have anything, you know, more of that, I'm just a vehicle. A chariot. Oh, my. A chariot. A vehicle. A, a fat, stupid soul. I'm trying to get through it all. Coming to the end of it. It's great. Great to see it coming. So glad to be part of Jewish history at this moment in time. It's such an honor to stand on these hilltops. To live like this is such an honor for this. I didn't know how. I didn't know where I where it merited such a such a blessing. I have no idea. Friends, and family, and Brook Hashem. To live in Eretz Israel, to live on the land, and to grow things in my with my hands, be part of this process that we've, we've yearned for for thousands of years. If you would show my great great grandfather in Poland fighting pogroms how his great great grandson would be living, part of his soul would be alive today. How would he be living? They show this video to him and say, what, ha what happened here? Say, Mashiach came. Mashiach came. I got a call from Mayor this week and uh, I recorded part of it and uh, it was very interesting. Soccer in the parking lot. It was Shabbos Kavron. What are you doing? About like fifteen thousand Jews. You know, all the all the settlers come in the Shabbos Kavron, and uh, there's a bunch of Jewish kids are standing around watching the Arabs play soccer. So they said to them, "Let's get into it." So they got into a soccer game between them. Well, I didn't know what, but it was very cool. The army stood by in astonishment, and uh, we could make deals with the Arabs. They came to us to make deals before in Kavron. They could cut a deal. There are forces who refuse to permit that to occur. People can get along very well. There's lots of ways that people can get along. The people understand each other, cut the deal. It can't be governments. People can get along. It just that happened. It was cute. Kids would sit just play against Arabs, Palestinians, and Hebron. <laughs>